Hi, and welcome to episode 11 of the Hormonal Mama podcast. As promised, today I'm starting my nine part series in understanding skincare and wellness, and specifically as those two relate to infertility, pregnancy, and postpartum, which is what the Hormonal Mama is all about. Today, I want to really break it down for you and talk about understanding skincare and understanding skin anatomy so that when I break it down over the next few episodes and talk about skincare products and hormonal changes in infertility, pregnancy, and postpartum, you can really get a better understanding of the skin and how different products interact with the skin and also how hormonal changes affect the skin. So sit tight, listen up, and let's get started. So let's start by talking about what skincare actually is. Before we can even talk about skin anatomy, I want you to understand what skincare means. I mean, it seems pretty straightforward. Skincare is taking care of your skin, but it goes a little deeper than that, if you will. So I just kind of want to give you the definition according to Wikipedia. It's a little more detailed than it needs to be, but I just want to read it to you. So the definition, according to Wikipedia, skin care is the range of practices that support skin integrity, enhance its appearance, and relieve skin conditions. They can include nutrition, avoidance of excessive sun exposure, and appropriate use of emollients. I think that's a pretty good definition, even though it's a little bit over detailed. Skin care isn't just caring for your skin. It goes, like I said, it goes deeper than that pun intended. There's a lot involved in skincare. It's not just making sure that your skin looks pretty. It's not just making sure that you're applying products appropriately to your skin. It's really making sure that your skin stays as healthy as it can. And that can include going to see an esthetician such as me um, and getting a facial or uh, any other type of cosmetic or dermatologic treatment. Um, So skincare, you know, in its simplest terms is caring for your skin. But really, like I said, it, it goes further than that. It's not just taking care of your skin and making sure that it's healthy. It's really making sure that you're not losing the integrity of the skin, like that definition said, enhancing the appearance of your skin. Now, this can sound however you know, it, it might sound a little dramatic or a little over the top, but not necessarily, right? So when we talk about enhancing the appearance of the skin, this can really be a multitude of things that you're doing to enhance the appearance of your skin, whether that's makeup or cosmetic procedures. It's really all very different. My specialty is in aesthetics, which is, you know, skincare. So let me break that down a little bit for you. I want you to understand what an esthetician actually is, because very often when I tell someone that I'm an esthetician, I get the response, oh, you're an anesthetist, so you give people anesthesia. That's not correct. (laughs) I get anesthetist, I get anesthesiologist, all the time when I say esthetician. Now, I get it. If you've never heard the word esthetician, it can be very easy to be a little confused by that and not understand what that means. For someone like me who has been in this industry for over 18 years, I giggle to myself when I hear someone say, oh, so you're an anesthesiologist? Well, no, if I was an anesthesiologist, that would be a whole different <laughs> story here. But I am an esthetician, okay? Okay. What is an esthetician? So it's possible that you may have heard the definition, not definition, you may have heard of the other titles for an esthetician, such as a cosmetician or a beautician. Now, we like to go by esthetician because it's a little more technical and a little more detailed, whereas cosmetician and beautician 
are, you know, they kind of are outdated terms. So for example, my esthetician license in my state used to say, for the majority of my 18 year career, it used to say cosmetician, but they updated that in, I mean, I want to say maybe in the past five years and they changed it to say esthetician. So an esthetician has specialized training in skincare and performing specific procedures like facials, hair removal, like waxing or sugaring. If you've never heard of sugaring, it's similar to waxing, but it's using a different sugar based material. Um, and it's a completely different type of process, but it's similar in its concept that you apply it to the skin and it removes hair. But you do need specialized training for this. Um, when I was in school and I went to school in 2003, we the sugaring, if it was a thing, it was something that we did not learn. <laughs> but I learned waxing. And this is part of the skin, right? Hair is part of the skin, if you think about it. And we'll talk a little more about that when I break down skin anatomy in a few minutes. Um, so Performing facials, hair removal, and the other main thing is makeup application. So when you hear makeup artist, not all makeup artists are estheticians, okay? But all estheticians have training in makeup application, though not all estheticians follow that path. So makeup artist is a pretty broad term. I have training in makeup. I've worked a lot of my career in makeup application as a makeup artist. I've done a lot of bridal makeup. It's no longer my focus, but that does fall under the category of esthetician. Okay. So three main areas that esthetician training focuses on is um, facials, hair removal, and makeup application. So I'd say in its most simplified definition, an, estel an esthetician, that's not what I meant to say, an esthetician has specialized training in aesthetics or the beautification of the skin. Widely known as a skincare specialist, or in some cases, you might even hear an esthetician referred to as a facialist. If you ever read articles in magazines like People or um, probably not Entertainment or Us Weekly or something like that, where it's all about celebrities and you read that about them going to see their facialist. Well, that's them going to see their esthetician who specializes in facials. Okay, so estheticians, we all have training in doing all of these different things. Some people choose to specialize in a certain area. So some estheticians will specialize in facials, and a lot of the time they'll be known as a facialist. Or they might be specialize in hair removal. So they might be a person's waxer, okay? Or... Like I said a minute ago, if you specialize in makeup application, they might be your makeup artist. And, and the list really goes on. What's just, I think, important to understand about an esthetician is our focus is on skincare. We are skincare specialists. We have extensive specialized training in the skin. Now, estheticians fall under the heading of cosmetology. So even though we're not cosmetologists and we don't have training in hair styling or hair care, some do. It really just depends on your school, your training, and your desires. My school was a cosmetology school, but I, I took the esthetician program. I didn't take the cosmetology program. Cosmetology, if you're a cosmetologist, your focus is on hair, but you also have training in skin care and nail care. So Anyway, we fall under the heading of cosmetologists, but we focus on skincare. And again, skincare is really focusing on taking care of the skin through various procedures like facials and waxing and makeup application, although the list goes on and it is a much longer list than that. But again, I'm just here to give you the basics so that you can kind of understand a little bit about why <laughs> I'm a specialist in this area and why I'm about to give you a lesson on skin anatomy.
Okay, so here we go. Let's talk about skin anatomy. Now, I know you may be thinking, why on earth am I listening to a podcast educating me about skin anatomy? That sounds so boring. And it might be boring to you. I totally get it. I just want to take a few minutes to really break down the skin for you so that when you listen to me telling you about products and why certain ingredients are good and why products are doing this and that and how hormones are affecting your skin and all of these things, I want you to understand how the skin works because the skin is complicated. It is not just a thin sheet that covers your muscles. A lot of people have that misconception that the skin is just this. I mean, it is thin. Don't get me wrong. But there are a lot of layers to the skin and there's a lot to understand. So let's start. Let me break it down for you. Skin anatomy 101. So here we go. All right. So when you look at the skin, it is made up of three main layers. You have your epidermis, which is your outermost layer. Okay. You hear epidermis. I mean, I'd say most people have heard of the epidermis. You might not know what it is, but you've probably heard of it. The middle layer is the dermis. And then you have the deepest layer of the skin called the hypodermis. Okay. Three layers, epidermis, dermis, hypodermis. Now, each layer has specific functions and other layers. The epidermis has the most layers, even though it's, I believe, not I believe, I'm about to tell you, it is the thinnest layer in terms of actual thickness. So the epidermis is made up of five layers, though most of the body, it's four layers. I'll get to that in a moment. The epidermis is around 0.1 millimeters total in thickness. So in the, these five layers, we put them together and you still only have 0.1 millimeters in thickness. So it's very, very thin, but a lot goes on. So <clears throat> what is the purpose of the epidermis? Well, the purpose is to give our bodies a barrier and protect us against UV radiation, ultraviolet radiation from the sun, harmful chemicals and pathogens like bacteria and viruses and fungus and all kinds of things. But it also protects us from water, okay? It protects our bodies from water invading our body. Okay, so I said a minute ago there are five layers, though in some areas there are four. Let me sort of back up and start with the outermost layer, which is everywhere on the body. It is called the stratum corneum, okay? Corneum, C-O-R-N-E-U-M. It's made up of about 20 to 30 layers of mostly dead, flattened skin cells that have no nuclei or cell organelles, okay? So these cells are now flat and there's nothing inside of them and they're dead, okay? The stratum corneum functions as the body's first line of defense. <clears throat> the name corneum is derived from the term cornification, which is also known as keratinization. Cornification occurs in this layer and is the process where living kerat keratinocytes are transformed into dead corneocytes, okay? The main function of this outer layer, the stratum corneum, is to help prevent the penetration of external toxins and bacteria and other harmful pathogens. It also repels water, protects against mechanical stress like abrasions that would harm the more delicate living lower layers of the epidermis. Okay. So our stratum corneum, our outermost layer, is our protective barrier. Below the stratum corneum is the stratum lucidum. Now, the stratum lucidum is this, la this extra layer that I was talking about a few minutes ago. This is that layer that gives five layers on certain areas, whereas most areas of the body have four layers. The stratum lucidum is only found in thicker skin on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Those are the, the two areas where you have the thickest skin, and therefore you have this extra layer. It is clear and it only consists of about two to three layers of more dead, flattened skin cells, similar to the cells in the stratum corneum. A little bit different, but similar. The main function 
of this layer is to give the skin the capability to stretch. The cells in this layer are filled with a protein called elaidin, E-L-E-I-D-E-N, which gives the skin cells their transparent appearance. The presence of elaidin, the protein, is what makes the skin waterproof. Okay, so let's talk a little bit for a minute about the capability of the skin to stretch. So if you look at the palms of the hands in particular, your skin can stretch a whole lot more than other areas of the body, except for like maybe the elbows. But that's a different area altogether. And the whole anatomy of the elbow is completely different. But I'm focusing on the palms of the hands where you can open them up really wide and stretch them. Okay. You don't need that ability on other parts of your body. Okay. You need that on your hands and on your feet. So when you close your hands into like a fist and then you open them really wide, think about that ability. If you look at your skin and you really focus, I'm doing it right now while I'm talking to you. If you open your hands and then you put them in a fist and you look at all that stretching that your skin can do, that is thanks to the stratum lucidum. The next layer underneath the stratum lucidum is the stratum granulosum, which is another relatively thin layer of the skin, only about three to five layers of skin cells. Now, the cells in this layer aren't completely flattened like the top two, like the stratum corneum and the stratum lucidum, but they have started the flattening process. So their shape is kind of like a diamond shape. It has a granular appearance, hence the name granulosum, due to the changes that the keratinocytes are going through. The main function of the stratum granulosum is to act as both a barrier for harmful substances from entering the, bar the, the barrier, <laughs> entering the body, and also it's a transitional layer where keratinocytes begin to die, causing their nuclei and other organelles to disintegrate before pushing up to the stratum lucidum and eventually the stratum corneum. So if you remember a minute ago, I was talking about in the stratum lucidum and the stratum corneum, how the cells don't have any um, organelles or nuclei. So this process begins in the stratum granulosum, okay? When you get out to those outer layers, the skin that you see when you look at your body, that's dead skin cells, and they don't have a nucleus or organelles. What are organelles? Well, basically... On a very simplified layer, organelles are basically organs for a cell, right? We have internal organs in our bodies. Well, cells have organs as well. They're called organelles because they're not really the same as our organs. But organelles are all the different parts of the cell that make it work. So within the, gra the stratum granulosum, these organelles and the nucleus begin to disintegrate. Okay. Next up under the stratum granulosum is the stratum spinosum. This is a thicker layer, right? The other layers we were talking about other than the stratum corneum, which has 20 to 30 layers. But remember, those layers are flat. And then the next two layers, there's only a couple of layers here. Here we have eight to 10 layers of cells. So in the stratum spinosum, these cells have a completely different shape. These have a polyhedral or three-dimensional shape. Within the stratum spinosum is the beginning of the keratinization process. Keratinization is a process during which epithelial cells become filled with keratin protein filaments. So when I say keratinization, I'm talking about keratin, okay? It's, <clears throat> excuse me. This is the process where keratin filaments fill, filaments fill, ha, huh? no, anyway, fill the cells. Now, when I talk about epithelial cells, epithelial cells are cells that line various structures inside and outside the body, including the skin. This is a lining. If you hear epithelial, just remember, this is a layer of, of uh, cells that line something. The main function of the stratum spinosum is to help with skin flexibility and to help the epidermis to withstand the effects of friction 
and abrasion. Okay, that is the stratum spinosum. Our bottom layer, the very last layer in the epidermis, is the stratum basal, B-A-S-A-L-E, also known as the stratum germinativum. It is the bottom layer, okay? The deepest layer, it contains stem cells that create keratinocytes and also contains melanocytes. Melanocytes have two functions. First, produces melanin, right, which gives skin its color. The second function is to protect the living cells in the skin from damage from UV radiation, okay? So our two main cells in this layer are melanocytes and keratinocytes. This layer is a single layer. It's a single, a single, a single layer of cells that are either cuboidal or columnar. So they're either in like a cube shape or like tall columns, okay? Um, if you go to my website and you check out my blog post, um, the title is Let's Talk About Skin Baby. Yeah, anyone? Ha <laughs> ha. You know, like, let's talk about sex, baby. Anyway, 90s, salt and pepper, whatever. Anyway, if you go to my website and you check out that blog post, I have a slideshow and I have some illustrations for you so you can get a better visual if you're a visual person. Um, okay, so the stratum germinativum or stratum basal is the bottom layer of the epidermis, okay? So we have five layers in the epidermis, okay? That's pretty... I don't know. That's pretty, uh, pretty thin. But again, unlike the layers in the outer, uh, unlike the cells in the outer layers, they're not flattened. Okay. They have like a three dimensional shape here. Now, below the epidermis lies the dermis. Now, the dermis is only made up of two layers, but even though it's only two layers, it is much thicker. So the dermis varies throughout the body, but it is between one and four millimeters. Still pretty small, but much thicker than the epidermis. Um, within the dermis are nerves, blood and lymph vessels, hair follicles, sweat glands, and other structures. Let's break down the dermis. We have two layers to the dermis. We've got the papillary dermis, which is the outer, not outer, but is the top layer of the dermis. It's made up of loose connective tissue, including collagen and elastin, as well as nerve fibers, touch receptors, phagocytes, and lymphatic capillaries. The collagen and elastin fibers in this layer form a loose mesh. The papillary layer is called this because it extends into the stratum basal in the dermis, uh, I'm sorry, the epidermis, right, which was our bottom layer in the epidermis, and it creates these finger-like projections known as papilla, okay? So again, if you check out my website and you look at this um, blog post, I have a slideshow and illustration so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. The papillary dermis has two main functions. One it supports the epidermis. Now, the epidermis is the avascular, meaning it has no blood vessels. So the papillary dermis, the first function in supporting the avascular epidermis is providing vital nutrients to the epidermis because of the dermis containing all of the blood vessels that it has. The second function of the papillary dermis is to regulate body temperature through a process known as thermoregulation. Okay. Next, the next layer below the papillary dermis is the reticular dermis. Now, the reticular layer of the dermis sits below the papillary dermis, like I said, and it is thicker. It consists, consists of dense, irregular connective tissue. It also contains hair roots, sebaceous glands, sweat glands and blood vessels. Okay. So this is a very uh, juicy, if you will, very juicy layer because it's got all of these structures, hair roots. It's where the root actually begins. Um, the main function of the reticular dermis is to give the skin strength, elasticity, and structure. And that's the dermis right there.
the end. It's just got those two layers. It's totally different than the epidermis, but it sits below the epidermis and it's got those two layers, the papillary and the reticular layers. Next and last is the hypodermis. The hypodermis is also known by a few different names. So if you've never heard hypodermis, you may have heard subcutaneous layer, subcutaneous tissue, or subcutis, okay? So the hypodermis, or any of the other titles that I just gave you, consists primarily of adipose tissue. What is adipose tissue? Adipose tissue is fat tissue. It also contains fibroblasts, macrophages, loose areolar connective tissue, larger nerves, and blood cells. There are two main functions of the hypodermis. Insulation, so conserving the body's heat, right? That's what the fat cells are there for. The other function is shock absorption and protecting the internal organs, which makes sense. If you, again, if you think about the fat tissue, it is, it's like a cushion, right? So it's shock absorption. It's absorbing that shock for you, protecting your internal organs from potential damage. And insulation, we need that, right? We need insulation in order to conserve our body heat. So I just want to end this by giving you a little fun fact about the hypodermis and understanding the thickness. The thickness of the hypodermis varies throughout the body and from person to person. So for example, in men, the hypodermis is thickest in the abdomen and shoulders and ranges from about 1.60 millimeters to, you ready for this? 25.45 millimeters. That's a huge range. In women, it's completely different. In women, it is thickest in the hips, thighs, and buttocks, which makes sense. And it ranges from 3.40 millimeters, so much thicker in women than in men, all the way up to 25.20 millimeters, right? So it's just completely different from men and women, not from men and women, well, yeah, from men and women, it's different between the two. And the huge range within from person to person and parts of the body is just a huge, huge range. I think it's fascinating. Again, I'm an esthetician, though, so I find all of this stuff fascinating. And really, I, I hope you do, too. So I hope that was helpful in understanding skin anatomy a little bit and a, a little background about what an esthetician is, what skincare is. T next week, I'm going to be breaking down a little bit further about how skincare products actually work with the skin. And I'm also going to talk about specific products. For example, I'm going to be talking about cleansers and exfoliants and masks and what all of these products do, but also how they work. Now that you understand all these different layers of the skin, I want you to understand how the products are going to affect the skin, how they're going to work with your skin. So I am looking forward to it. I hope you're looking forward to it too. And I will see you next time.